Hollywood with Rao Rampilla. Today, this is very special. We have a writer and a producer of The Simpsons, The Simpsons, <laughs> Mike Reese. Hello, nice yeah, to be here, Rao. my guest here. Um, Mike is very accomplished. Uh, he has been to Harvard, Harvard Lamp Lampoons. Yes. He was on Johnny Carson's show. I wrote for Johnny Carson for a couple of years, yeah. And then uh, he's here now to tell all about The Simpsons. Here we are. This is the highlight of my career. <laughs> I, uh, Welcome, Mike. It's great to be here, yeah. Ralph. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. I'm, I'm so glad you are here. Well, you know, I watched a few episodes of Simpsons. Oh, thanks. Like any other Indian. Uh huh. Uh, but I don't know anything about Simpsons. The show, you know, by the way, uh, I think it was about 15 or 18 years into its run. The show's been on for 25 years. But it was about 18 years before it came to India. And I think it took off huge there. You know, so late in the run, they've really embraced it. So it's nice that suddenly, after, after two decades, to get a billion new viewers. But uh, how did you come up with this idea? Is it your idea? It is not my idea. I didn't create the show. It was a guy named Matt Groening, very sort of famously or legendarily thought of the whole show in five minutes. He was coming into Fox for a meeting, and he thought this is one of those meetings, you know these meetings in Hollywood where you just shake hands and you become friends and they never call you again. And he thought it was one of those meetings and he came in, and five minutes before the meetings, they said, they said, we're very excited about your new project. And he had no new project. So in five minutes, he drew the Simpsons family, and he just named them after his family. Matt Groening's father is named Homer, and his mother's name is Marge, and his sisters are Lisa and Maggie. So it was five minutes' work, and they bought it there. And, you know, it's gone on to be this international empire off of five minutes' work. And I always think, gee, what if, what if he had put an hour into it? Think how great it might have been. Oh, I was, I was thinking probably Homer means somebody came up with uh, somebody who stays at home, and that's why they call him Homer. Or... Well, you could, you could be a professor. <laughs> there, there, there are college courses in The Simpsons all over America now, college oh, really? courses, and there are professors coming up with analyses like that, saying that's why it's Homer. I once saw it. It was a, I was speaking, I'll say where, I was speaking at the University of Oklahoma, and uh, this professor gave the introduction saying he's, home, he's named Homer because he's like Homer's odyssey and he's on a quest for enlightenment. And, you know, it was a beautiful theory, but it was 100% wrong. And just, he just named it after his dad. There wasn't that much thought put into it. That's very interesting. What about Springfield? I mean, I was in Massachusetts. There is a Springfield in Massachusetts. Uh, is it a... Mm, what's, what's interesting is one of the guys, there's only been three or four of us who've run the show. I mean, it's, it's a job you take for two years or five years. And one of, the, one of the five of us is from Springfield, Massachusetts. You'd think, oh, it's got to be him. But uh, we... Again, Matt Groening picked the name Springfield because there are 48 Springfields in America. I there would are, it is the most common place name in America. There's 48 Springfields in 43 states, which means that there are, there are five states that have two Springfields in them. These are states lacking in creativity. But so we, that's why we called it Springfield, we call it, for a couple of reasons. We called it Springfield because there, it could be anywhere in America, and also because there was a show in the 50s called Father Knows Best. It was a very kind of generic sitcom. It was very popular, and they lived in Springfield. And again, it was Springfield who knows where. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I was a little bit intrigued with me being an Indian, yeah. you know, the, uh, let's say Bollywood connection. Um, the Apu character. Yes. I remember uh, in the 60s, the director went to India and found this kid in Rajasthan and brought him up. And he was in all the movies in the 60s. Uh, yes. And the character was Apu. And the character on our show is named after the Apu trilogy of films. It's, uh, so that was the history for that. That's well, it's a, I, I know we got time. Do you mind if I tell the story? Sure, I think sure. The, it's the, the best Bollywood story I can tell you about The Simpsons. Um, 
the first season of the show, and I think it was probably like three or four episodes in, uh, we wrote an episode. There were three or four of us writing an episode together, and there was just a scene where Bart went to the Quickie Mart, went to the convenience store, and the clerk was there, and the clerk had one line. He said, 35 cents, please. And at the time, this is like 1989, it was <laughs> such a cliche in American movies that all convenience store clerks were Indian. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I do not want, you know, we're the Simpsons. I don't want to do that cliche. So I said, the clerk says, 35 cents, please. And underneath, in capital letters and bold face, I wrote, he is not an Indian. And then we get to the day of the recording, and Hank Azaria, who, who plays up who, he gets to the line, or he gets to the line of the clerk, and he goes, 35 cents, please. He does it with an Indian accent, and it got this giant laugh. And that's when, that's how Apu became Indian. It was over my objections, and that's when I learned that Hank Azaria doesn't read stage directions. I see. Let's that, see, that's what I was wondering. How come they cast this Apu character, Indian, and how somebody American, you know, he's a very good actor. Yes. Uh, him do the part of an Indian. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, when there, there are 200 characters on The Simpsons and they're performed by eight people. So uh, there's a lot of multiple roles going on and all the black characters on our show are performed by white people. And the guy who plays Apu is actually, he's a Jewish guy from Queens. Uh -huh. And uh, uh -huh, that's what I figured. Yeah, <laughs> how good is the, uh, when you hear Apu, if you if you hear Apu, is it a good accent? Is it passable? It's uh, it's it's uh, it's very standardized, uh, uh, stereotypical accent. Stereotypical, okay. But see, I speak with Indian accent. This is natural. Yeah. Even though it is less reduced. And you're accent. a Jewish guy from Queens, so also. I'm an Indian Jew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're a Hindu Jew. But all, all my professors are Jewish, mm -hmm. both in the law school. And in the acting school. Yeah. Uh, and see, and, and my guests are Jew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, I am in this uh, world of uh, uh, Jewish intellectuals. Uh, yeah. And bred and brought up. Uh, so I, I can't re really get away from it. You but, can't escape uh, us. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> You're trying uh, to get away from Jews uh, and you move to New York. Yeah. Great move. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story. So Apu, he became a character on the show. and. Again, it shows you how we make up things on the show. It's a little idea here, and we never knew if the character would reappear. But he just kept coming back, and then we gave him a wife, and we, we started exploring his Hindu religion on it, because we do a lot of religious-themed shows on The Simpsons, exploring religion. So we researched Hinduism. We got books on it just to get it right, and he has a Ganesh in the back room, and it was fun. It was very educational for us. But all the years I was doing it, I had an Indian friend in Los Angeles, and I just never mentioned Apu to her, because I just thought, is this offensive to her? Or, you know, maybe we've just made a horrible faux pas. And finally, I said to her, what do you think of Apu? And she said, he's the only Indian on television. And that was it. She was just happy to be represented on TV. Now, since then... Well, you know, I may differ with that, because... Not all Indians are so religious. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, I oppose uh, caste system mm -hmm. because it did a horrible number. Uh, it kept 300 million people as slaves. Um, so uh, it, it's, there may be some good aspects to the spirituality, but uh, I, I think lately they are buying Hinduism as a wholesale. Uh, ah, interesting. See, uh, and, and, and uh, so there are also downsides to it. Because any religion that kept uh, 300 million people as slaves in this modern age uh, is not laudable. But uh, I think there is a trend. There is a trend. I think everyone is bringing Hinduism and putting on American TV. Yes. Well, there's certainly there are a lot more Indians on TV now. I don't think we caused it, but now you see plenty of them. You see, and they're always that you know Big Bang Theory. There's an Indian character, and all, any medical show will always have one Indian doctor. It's it's sort of the new stereotype. It's the new convenience store clerk. Is you got to have an Indian doctor there, and it's a it's a great role model. Well, I, I started as a, a Indian doctor. You were a doctor too. Yeah, that's how I started uh, uh, my acting career. Oh, 
with a Super Bowl commercial with Kevin <laughs> Bacon. They picked me out of all the Indians. So from a... Out a, of a billion Indians, <laughs> they chose you. My father but always wanted me to become a doctor. <laughs> And so so you no, played he is gone. And you did it on the Super Bowl. So, wow. so you can get become a better doctor than on the Super Bowl. <laughs> what was the commercial for? Oh, that's a visa commercial, 2002, right Dear. after 9-11. Ah. I was a lawyer after before that. So you know, you I keep was. dragging this right out of comedy. We're having a great time. Then it's the caste system. Then we're having more fun. You bring up 9-11. But <laughs> we'll, we'll keep bringing it back. But... Uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. You know, lately I have been exploring Ibsen, Strindberg. Okay, now we're into comedy. Okay. Chek Chekhov, right? Uh -huh. Chekhov is a big comedy. It's <laughs> serious. Um, he is funny. I mean, his stuff is meant to be played comedically, and he's, he, they always play Chekhov heavy and dramatic, and it can be very funny, and he certainly wrote some funny stories. So um, I'm thinking, so if you look at the Bollywood, yeah, they have the stereotypical image of... Uh, five songs, hero, villain, uh, heroine, she cries. Yeah. Uh, so same story, it's all entertainment. But what I learned studying Ibsen, Strindberg, and Chekhov is uh, you bring the reality, social life, social issues that have not been done in the Bollywood yet. So maybe in some Bengali movies mm -hmm. like Sachjit Ray. Yeah. Uh, and they're also, you know, Gorky's mother Mother is a great movie in India. Uh, but anyhow, so could, is there a possibility of bringing that reality and social issues into Simpsons? Oh, wow. Ah, uh, gosh, we flirt with it. So, I mean, we're a comedy and a cartoon. I mean, we're, so we're already two steps away from reality. But the show will get pretty dark, and it will take on terrorism as a topic. And we did it once. We handled the whole Iraq war. We didn't take it head on, but we took it, we did it on our Halloween show where we, we had aliens that, uh, invade Springfield and take over. And it became pretty clear pretty quickly that uh, this was all a metaphor for the U.S. going into Iraq and it was a bad occupation. And uh, so the people in Springfield became the terrorists suddenly. And I don't know, it made a really good point, but that's how we handle subjects obliquely and We'll hit on a subject for five minutes and say everything we have to say about it. Uh, the other thing we'll do on The Simpsons is sometimes we'll take on an issue and we'll give our point of view and then we'll give it a left turn. We'll make sure we don't look like we're preaching and, you know, it's, we'll do a show about guns and almost a lot of The Simpsons people are, are sort of liberal and for gun control and we'll do a show saying gun control is great and then something just horrible will happen because people don't have guns. And that's it. Our, our main belief is people shouldn't be getting their opinions from a cartoon on Fox. But uh, you know, I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. Um, I worked with Adam Sandler. Yes. Um, I'm a serious guy. <laughs> but uh, I kept wondering, how does the comedy come in? Uh, a lot of people think if they put up an accent, that they say things in a particular way, the comedy comes in. But uh, I have serious doubts about it. As, as an experienced uh, comedy writer, yeah. you know, what do you think? How, 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 what's the origins of this comedy? Uh, boy, I sure don't know. That's my big answer. And I, I was just, I, I was thinking about it this morning, I guess in anticipation of this. But I've been thinking about it for years. Like, What's funny? What makes something funny? Where does comedy come from? And something that was funny 10 years ago isn't funny now. And Or the, the fact that you can do a joke about 9-11 now that you couldn't do 10 years ago. And it's like, how, you know, how can the same joke be funny and not funny in, in different times? And I've never been able to figure it out, if, if, if that's your big question. I, I don't, I, you know, I do it. Comedy comes out of me. This is something I do. I've done it my whole life. And uh, I always think it's just the way some people can draw. Some people can sing. I make comedy. Uh, and I have this terrible fear. Someday it'll all vanish because I don't know where it comes from or what I'm doing. Someday I'll wake up and I'll go into work and I'll be saying the same things. And everyone will go, well, that's not funny. Nothing funny came out of you. And it's, those sort of have gone just as easily as it came along.
I mean, do you believe probably it's in the family or it's in genes? Or I don't. I don't think so. I don't think. I mean, I come from a very funny family. My we have two people in the audience, and one of them is my funny cousin. Uh -huh. uh, and Jew. I'll, I'll say this about Jews. Jewish people used to dominate comedy. They dominated comedy, and especially when I got into TV writing in like 1981, 82. Everybody was Jewish. Everybody, everybody. And I just thought, well, nobody's funnier than Jews. And 30 years later, the business is maybe 20% Jewish writers. On The Simpsons, we have, I think, five Jewish writers out of 25 writers. And so 20%, right? I'm Jewish. I do math. So, uh, so that's it. Jews just aren't as big in comedy as they used to be. And when I was a kid, too, comedians were all Jewish. If you would watch variety shows, every comedian was Jewish, and now they're not. Now you see waspy comedians, and you see handsome, you know, Gentile comedians, and certainly black comedians. You see Asian comedians. I don't see any Indian comedians. I've, well, do you um, know of any? It seems like uh, everyone is coming up now. Yeah. Like we took over your grocery stores, now we are taking over your <laughs> comedy, <laughs> <laughs> comedy clubs. <laughs> Um, so the point is, no, I think growing up, I was always heard, oh, Jews are funny, and we're just funny. There's something about our culture, and then now they're not so funny anymore. Maybe it is the situation. What? Maybe it is the situation. I think the, it's a You stay with the character. I think it's assimilation. I think that's because my Jewish friends now talk about their kids, and they always talk, my kid is great in hockey. And I go, Jews don't play hockey, but now they do. They play hockey, and they play soccer, and... Now that they do sports, oh, they don't have to be funny and charming anymore. Well, uh, would the Simpsons uh, would uh, bring something reality? Are there, are there any um, undercurrent politics? Uh, like a subtext? Uh, not particularly. We take on issues. I mean, mostly the show to us is just a big hole we have to shovel jokes into every week. I mean, people try to ascribe great meaning or tr import to what we're trying to do or what we're trying to say to the show. And all we're trying to do every week is fill a half hour. That's it. And we'll just put anything in there that we think is funny. And, uh, you know, and when you're preachy, when you're making a point, then you're not being funny. But that's, that's all we want to do is kind of be funny and be smart. You don't want to be funny in a lazy way. When you were talking about doing accents and or having a fat person or any of that stuff, we don't go for that. I mean, that is that's sort of Adam Sandler stock and trade. It's a gallery. <laughs> it is. It's a gallery of freaks and geeks and mm -hmm. a fat guy and an ugly woman and oh, here's the gay guy who's really gay and. I, I don't I don't dislike Adam Sandler because I think there's always a, a lot of humanity in his movies. Even though he has all these kind of gross caricatures in his his movies, they always end kind of nicely. They always end with just humanity being important and regular people are all right and the ugly girl is not such a bad person and some there'll be some guy who's turned on by the ugly girl at the end of the movie. So I admire his humanity in that, but yeah, he really goes for that. Suppose if we bring Chakal to this century. Okay. And put him in the chair, <laughs> <laughs> or in my chair. Okay. Uh, uh, so, would it be any different? <laughs> <laughs> well, if Chekhov was here, I, I wouldn't call it Bollywood to Hollywood. <laughs> I'd call it Minsk to Pinsk or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but, uh, I don't know. There's. There's that question. If Chekhov was writing today, what would he be writing? Would he be writing TV shows? Would he be writing a play? Would he be writing the new... Would he, I was going to say, would he write the new Star Trek movie? But they've already got a Chekhov on Star Trek. So, I don't know. I don't know what these guys would do today. I assume he would be successful now. I think there's, there's a place for Chekhov today. He's still, you know, they'll bring him to Broadway every once in a while and... The plays hold up. They're great. I mean, you are you are a very advocate of uh, certain causes, oh. like uh, that duck. Um, what, what is that duck? What hero? my queer duck? Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. You were you are help. You were trying to portray them in a proper way. Yes, I I'll talk about that. I created a cartoon called Queer Duck. 
Uh, it was just one day in the year 2000. It's just like Apu, in fact. It's just like this Apu story, which is, I was reading an article in the year 2000 that said, that said, there are no gay people on TV. Now, gay people, I, I'd worked with a lot of gay people in show business, and they love TV, and, and they, they would... Tend to be more creative, right? To what? Tend to be very creative. Yes. And that was it. But they would always come in in the morning, did you see this on TV? Oh, wasn't it? We had a good party to watch this Raquel Welch TV movie. That was it. They loved TV. And then I read this article that said, there are no gay characters on television. And this is, this is 13 years ago. It was before Glee. It was before mm -hmm. Anderson Cooper. There were just no gay people around. And so I said, well, that's just wrong. And so I created a cartoon with a gay a gay Bugs Bunny. That was my idea. Let's have a gay hero in a cartoon. And I called it Queer Duck. I made him a gay duck. And people, people again, they never get the inspiration of that, which is when I was this kid, there was a saying where you would say, that guy's a real queer duck. And you didn't mean he was gay. You just meant, it was a way of saying he's an odd fellow. He's a queer duck. So I said, all right, he's queer and he's a duck. He's queer duck. And he had gay animal friends, bipolar bear and openly gator and this cartoon just came on the internet and it was a sensation it was tremendous it was such a huge hit that the the website kept crashing because people were just pouring in to watch queer duck and it wasn't genius it was just he's the only gay cartoon character out there and so it endured and i was very proud of this thing but I had to keep it secret that I'm not gay. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm not, you know, I just didn't want people thinking, oh, who's this guy? Or we like Queer Duck. Oh, it's funny. Oh, wait, he's straight? He's just making fun of us then. And, and so reporters would come to the house, and I'd have to hide my wedding pictures, and I'd lock my wife in the bedroom, which oh. I do anyhow. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> but that was it. And so Queer Duck, it goes on and on. It's a movie now. You can get... Um, I'm pitching right to the audience here. You can, there's a Queer Duck movie you can get on Amazon. You can get it on Netflix. It's fun. It's a fun little cartoon. Or you can see it for free on uh, icebox.com. Go to icebox.com and look for Queer Duck. Is there a way to bring that one into Simpsons? Uh, you know what? They animated him. I was so proud of this. They put him in the Simpsons once. They, uh, they had a gay pride parade. Mm -hmm. And they had a big balloon of queer duck going on during the parade, and I was so excited. And then uh, they cut it. They cut it. The show was too long. And you know what can I say? This was. It wasn't a big joke to have a queer duck balloon. It was just a way of making me happy. And so they had to finally cut it. I never even saw it. I know they animated it, and I wasn't around. I never got to see it. But I can't bring queer duck. I, you know, I, the the Simpsons. Simpsons is a big important thing. You can't use it just to make a couple of guys happy on the show. Well, you know, people are more accepting when somebody something is an animal. Yes. When it is not homosexual, bisexual, no sexual at all. That's uh, right. it, it's, uh, it's it's more accepting rather than see a person. So maybe that's one way of uh, telling the society to how to somehow infiltrate these ideas. Uh, it's always a great way. I think we certainly do it on The Simpsons every week. We get away with stuff you couldn't do on a live action show. I mean, the best example of that is that uh, Homer, Homer strangles his son every week. He strangles his kid. He, he commits child abuse, and people love it. They love it. It's a, it's a trademark of the show. And it would be, it would be so horrifying in a live action show. Homer. Would have gone to jail after the third episode. We'd never see him again. But maybe there is something in The Simpsons that appeals to everyone, like yeah, general life, the way of life in uh, in America, in a small town America. There's so something. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story about that, which is uh, The Simpsons is a hit in America. Mm -hmm. It's a much bigger hit in other places. I mean, they love it so much more in South America. They love it in South America. They love it in Canada and Australia. Now they love it in India. They love it in Russia and uh, Israel. I mean, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty wide net to cast. But one thing I found in my travels is 
in America, we say, oh, we're, we're making fun of people and we're making fun of family life. And in a lot of these other countries, they go, they're making fun of Americans. They always, <laughs> they always, <laughs> and that's the big thing. They always say, oh, you really do a great parody of American culture. And it's like, oh, we're, these are supposed to be all people. And I get the sense the viewers in these countries get it. And they say, oh, yes, Homer's like my father. But I don't think the critics and the scholars get that. They think, oh, we're just sending up American culture. Oh, give me, can I tell you a story? Sure. Yeah, why not? Of course I can tell you a story. <laughs> the that's the show. I won't I've been talking too much. Uh, Let no, someone no, not else at all. Talk. Um, uh, and now I forgot the story I was going to tell. Oh, I, I'll tell you. So we make fun of people or mm -hmm. Americans every week on The Simpsons. But every year we do an episode where they go to another country. And when we do that, the other country doesn't think it's so funny. Suddenly, oh, the Simpsons aren't so funny. When the, the Simpsons went to Brazil, we got sued by the Brazilian Tourist Council. Oh, really? Uh, when they went to Japan, uh, the Japanese pulled us off the air. They never showed us again. The French pulled them. First season, Simpsons went to France. The French canceled our show for 18 years. Really, French? Yes. Oh, the French boy, the French with their great sense of humor. Yeah, they. Uh, they they show all new or something like that. Uh, yes. Well, that's it. I, guess, I think there wasn't <laughs> enough nudity on the show for that. Uh, yeah, Australia. We were condemned in the Australian Parliament. Oh. So that's it. It's okay to make fun of us, but not them. There was a, and in India, we got in a little trouble. Thank <laughs> you.